I want to talk about PBMs and, and basically the concept of, 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 of uh, corporate medicine and corporations uh, putting profits before patients. So this is uh, a sign. This is at the, the Reagan uh, Airport in Washington, D.C., and I've been uh, at this airport six times uh, since February, um, running around trying to, to make changes in D.C. and wade around in the swamp. But as you go down the that down the escalator um, down to, to baggage claim, there's you know this huge sign there, uh, uh, billboard that, that uh, basically this pops up saying pharma pharmacy benefit management tools can save Medicaid a hundred billion dollars, and this is an advertisement by U the United Healthcare Group. And I'm going really, who are these pharma pharmacy benefit guys, and how can they you know how can they save us you know so much money? What are, what do they consist of and made up? Uh, in order to do that. Well, pharmacy benefit managers, uh, they were originally came into play uh, as a third party man manager of prescriptive drug claim, uh, claims, and they generally came out of the Medicare Modernization Act of 2003, where the Medicare Part D program was implemented in, in 2006. And so as, as over the years, we've had continued escalating and rising cost of drugs, uh, it, it just seemed to make sense that, that for the management of drugs, for the, for the, for the payers, uh, and and for the for the employers, you know, trying to look for better methods of of controlling drug costs, uh, you have these pharmacy benefit managers that that said, hey, we can take uh, you know all the prescriptions of all your patients in your population, and we can we can better control those and better manage those. So so they they came out with good intentions, uh, like everybody does originally. Uh, and and they they've considered themselves to be the controllers of drug costs. But like a lot of things that happen with good intentions initially, uh, they've become perversified. And, uh, and I know that's not a real word, but uh, they've become perversified. And so when we look at the pharmacy benefit uh, landscape, you know, the patients uh, down there at the bottom, you know, they, they negotiate with their, their plan sponsor. So that's usually your employer or a union or a government agency. And historically in the past, you know, the plan sponsor would, wouldn't, uh, you know, as, as you need a prescription from your doctor, you go to your pharmacy and, and, they, and the plan sponsor pays the pharmacy uh, for your drugs. Uh, but the PBMs came into play. And so as, as you go through your, your health insurance plan, the PBMs, work um, to negotiate uh, rates with, with, the, with the health insurance companies. And uh, as a result of that, uh, they, they negotiate rebates from the manufacturers. Uh, they, they negotiate uh, preferred formularies and preferred uh, uh, pricings with the health insurance companies. And what the PBMs uh, 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 also do is they, they uh, negotiate uh, with pricing and, uh, and rates with the pharmacy but the, uh, one of the bigger things that we're seeing now is the PBMs are, are developing and owning their own specialty pharmacies and their own pharmacies. So they're actually taking control of the pharmacy also. So the patients are, are increasingly either getting drugs through their through their, their pharmacy that they've had for years or, or they're getting increasingly more drugs that are coming through the, the PBM managed and owned pharmacies. So, uh, so, so the PBMs have, have managed drug spending by encouraging the use of generics, uh, cost shifting to, to where they have uh, the, the patients pay more out of pocket for their prescriptions and their drugs. And they have a lot of different mechanisms to do that. Uh, formulary management to where they have step edits and they have preferred drugs. Uh, and, and in many of these uh, PBM specialty pharmacies, they've taken drugs off their formulary altogether. So they're not even a choice. And then just channel management of where you're getting uh, your drugs uh, and, and the contracts that they negotiate with individual hometown pharmacies, uh, in which those are increasingly becoming more and more narrow, and more and more of those hometown pharmacies are becoming out of network uh, with the relationships with the PBMs. So again, the PBMs work in a, in a, a variety of ways in order to try to provide benefits for third-party payers by, by negotiating rebates with the manufacturers, managing networks with the dispensing pharmacies and influencing patient behavior um, uh, with the choices that they have for their drugs. And so uh, the evolving role, some of these things may be good, uh, such as the core function of formulary and benefit plan design and, uh, and retail network management uh, with their negotiation with the drug, with the uh, pharmacies. Uh, and then uh, they do a lot of mail order pharmacy, as you know. 
and uh, some of their key emerging trends is, is uh, getting more so into uh, utilization management policies and then multi-tier prescription drug plans to where uh, they, they put drugs in different different tiers depending on their cost and expense. So like the chemotherapy drugs that I, I uh, prescribe are in the fifth tier and the, and the, the high-ranking tier. And then they're, they're creating more and more out-of-network pharmacy de- designations. And, and this results in some general criticisms of the way that they, they make their money because uh, they make tremendous profits uh, off, of, off of rebates and uh, uh, spreading prices and then uh, uh, fees, uh, where they charge fees on the, on the existing pharmacies that are out there. So, um, so those things in general may sound, you know, like a pretty favorable thing for pharmacy benefit managers, but, but what happens, what is happening is, is they're, they're becoming bigger and huger. So there, there's, a, there's another view here to where, you know, over this last year, Healthcare mega mergers are starting to dominate, and uh, and so what we're seeing is is that healthcare changes, insurances, and uh, hospitals are, are 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 teaming up and joining together and forming bigger and broader and more expansive networks, and so we start to see you know notifications and ads in the newspaper of CVS you know, pharmacy buying Aetna, you know, for, for $69 billion. And, and, and that was the first, to, you know, to, to reshape uh, the healthcare industry. And then uh, as a result of that, that triggered uh, further big hospital mergers, uh, particularly in the Midwest and Missouri there. And, uh, and then Cigna uh, agrees to buy Express Scripts uh, for more than $50 billion in that transaction. So what you're starting to see is alignment of insurance companies with the pharmacy benefit managers, with the specialty pharmacies. Um, and, uh, and, and so now you get uh, even bigger entities like major corporations like Amazon and other, other major corporations that are trying to, to get, get into this entire healthcare industry. And uh, and management of drugs and trying to 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 make profit off of off of uh, drugs um, through through their own corporations, and uh, so so then we have uh, you know Walgreens that's revamping their their stores uh, as as you know the Amazon and CVS deals loom, and then we we see that Walmart and Humana are working on a deal. And, uh, and, and so as we continue to look, you know, the, the Amazon, Berkshire Hathaway, and J.P. Morgan are all teaming together to try to disrupt health care and redefine a, a way to deliver health care and, and bypass the PBMs and those kind of things. So, um, so uh, you know, employers are, are having to, to rethink the, the pharmacy benefit management uh, strategy, strategies with these kind of things going on. Uh, but the, the kind of the sad thing about all this is we're seeing the disappearing doctor uh, because as you're, you know, as you have independent uh, practices, it becomes increasingly more d- difficult for you to sustain your, your practice when you're having these kind of pressures that are looking more and more at the corporatization of medicine and, uh, and seeing more and more of the individual physicians being hired uh, and employed uh, by these corporations and hospital systems. And uh, you know, example of that is you know United Healthcare, um, that that has Optum uh, PBM, you know, also has thirty thousand doctors <laughs> that are are in their workforce that are that have pr- prescriptive, you know, pres- prescriptive influence on that relationship uh, between those entities. So so what does all this mean? It just means that there's you know consolidation and consolidation and consolidation, but that consolidation is actually huge growth to where you get a consolidation of several uh, uh, gargantuan corporations. And, uh, and, and the costs uh, have increased with these consolidations, both for the, the patients and the insurers. And so, you know, CVS started out as a drugstore, but now they want to be everything. You know, they, they started out just being a drugstore, but now they got a medical clinic to where you got, you know, uh, uh, mid-levels that are there um, seeing patients. And, uh, and they've created a specialty pharmacy and an infusion center. So um, they're even infusing or trying to infuse chemotherapy drugs and other biologic agents there uh, and, and trying to run all the, the, the complex uh, uh, drugs through the fem- uh, specialty pharmacy. They got the mail order pharmacy going. 
They, they have benefit plan sponsor, pharmacy, pharmacy benefit management program, uh, and now they're be you know part of uh, being an insurer also. So what else is is CVS going to be in this arrangement? Because they're not just your 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 little corner drugstore anymore. So what we get, what we see with this consolidation is with the with the players currently. There's three major players that that involve uh, you know over over seventy percent. That's uh, CVS and Express Scripts and Optum uh, with United Healthcare, and you can see the other players there. And so when you look at specialty uh, dispensing, which is uh, a lot in the realm of what I deal with, uh, you can see that the vast majority is now within the PBMs. So that's being taken out of the hands of your local retail pharmacies, uh, retail pharmacies at the hospitals, uh, uh, re retail pharmacies at the cancer centers, uh, and uh, and even your, your hometown uh, pharmacies that are in your small town, uh, Texas, is, is taking that out of the hands of those guys. And so it's huge because today, you know, PBMs control the pharmacy benefits of over 253 million Americans. I mean, that's virtually everybody. And again, as I just mentioned, there's three PBMs that do greater than 70% of, of that population. And so what we've seen just in recent years very rapidly is horizontal integration to where all these PBMs are consolidating and becoming uh, you know, bigger and bigger into fewer, fewer and fewer groups. But the, the really scary thing is the vertical integration going on to where you are seeing you know, the buyouts and, and the relationships between the insurer and the PBM and the specialty pharmacies. So they have that entire control of the whole system. And they're also having relationships with many of the GPOs, you know, such as McKesson and Cardinal and Amerisource Burgeon. So they're, they're even getting into the drug distribution business and uh, they're hiring physicians and employing physicians to drive the, the prescriptions that way. So um, th these kind of uh, integrations are very much uh, the, what's right around the corner for us uh, in the future. And it, it doesn't bode well for those of us trying to, to maintain independent uh, private practices uh, when you're fighting with, with these kind of folks. It was mentioned earlier about the, uh, the, you know, the executive salaries. And uh, this isn't the greatest um, quality of a slide, but basically it's just, you know, the, the, the general basic salaries before bonus, uh, and, and these are in the tens of millions, you know, 19 million, 18 million, 14 million, 15 million, you know, that's a lot of, that's a lot of money every year for the CEO of these uh, uh, money, uh, for these uh, companies. And again, it just, it just tells us that they're making a tremendous amount of money off, off the, the transaction of that drug uh, between just the payment of the insurer and getting that drug to the patient. And, and they're strictly just being a middleman. All they do is, 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 is pass paperwork. They're not making a product or anything like that and making a tremendous amount of money off of that. Some of the negative impacts that, that, that um, PBMs can have on the delivery of care is uh, there, there's, there's mechanisms where it actually can increase the cost to the patients in the healthcare system. Uh, it can increase the out-of-pocket out costs for the patients. Uh, there's lack of transparency with their negotiations and the rebates that they get are, are kept within the, the PBMs and they're not passed back on to the patients. Um, there's a lot of waste, uh, which I'll talk about. Uh, there's delays and denials. Uh, to where, as, as I'm trying to get life-saving cancer drugs to, can to, to patients, uh, a lot of times I'm, you know, running into pre-auth issues and peer-to-peer -peer reviews and all that kind of stuff, uh, and just getting the drug delivered to the patient in a timely manner is very difficult, especially when you're dealing with step therapies and prior authorizations and those kind of things. And um, uh, there, there's limited pharmacy and provider networks, and so there's prohibition uh, of in-office dispensing in, in many states. And then uh, there's a, a lot of demand for brown bagging and white bagging of these drugs from the PBMs into the uh, uh, treatment centers in order to, to, to give uh, uh, you know, the patients uh, their, their drugs. And then there's a lot of hidden fees and penalties and contractual restraints. There's the DIR fees, the direct and indirect re remuneration fees. And, uh, and, and that's a, a complex payment structure that occurs all between the middlemen to where your, your manufacturer makes a drug, uh, they, they, they sell it to the wholesaler, you get a wholesale price that's sold to the pharmacy, uh, and then the pharmacy bills the PBM for the, for the 
the, the current retail price, and then they report that to CMS, and CMS pays that back to the PBM, and the PBM pays that back to the pharmacy. Uh, but then what happens is the PBM gets a rebate from the wholesaler. So, so from that rebate, the PBM has to report back to the CMS what they actually paid for that. And so when the, PB, when the PBM reports to the CMS out of transparency uh, or, or, or uh, the, that they paid less for that, then they want the money back from the pharmacies. And so, so there's clawbacks and, and, and money that comes back through the, the pharmacy that they want back when, with those negotiated fees. But so, so basically what happens is, is it, it drives all that money towards the PBMs to make even more money for the PBMs. But they, the PBMs falsely put these DIR uh, fees in the context of, of quality measures, you know, in the pharmacies. Are they doing certain benchmarks and, and quality uh, benchmarks and measures and that kind of stuff? Which are mostly uh, irrelevant, but it's it's a significant impact. So, like I said, I own my own pharmacy, and uh, and this last year we paid you know two hundred and eighty thousand dollars of DIR fees uh, to the PBMs, you know, and, uh, and and again that was for the pleasure of you know uh, d doing writing prescriptions for our patients through our pharmacy. So specifically for the concerns in the oncology community, the PBMs are, are one of our number one things on our radar at the American Society of Clinical Oncology. And the Community Oncology Alliance has found that the, you know, the PBMs are continue to push uh, the dispensing of these drugs away from the physicians. And that's really important because most oncology practices, just to give you an oncology perspective real quick, whether it's academic or hospital-based or an independent private practice like mine, uh, we're giving drugs that are not only financially toxic, uh, uh, but, but, you know, they're physically toxic also. And we'd really like to have control and management of those drugs because of cost and, and physical toxicities. And, you know, we have, uh, you know, cancer student pharmacists who know those people by name and know them personally, and they have access to all their medical records and all that. And that gets taken out of our hands uh, and pushed to the PBMs. And then the PBMs are, are you know, uh, messing with the drugs the drug prescriptions, the drug doses, and those kind of things. And the bad thing is, is in my practice, I've seen about a 10% increase per year from 40% to 50% to 60% of our Part D drugs, our oral drugs. 60% uh, of those are now uh, have left outside my office or, and are being managed by PBMs. And let me just give you one one specific case of mine that just kind of what, what I consider the egregious conduct of, of the PBMs. And so I have a, a, a patient, Tom, and he has stage three rectal cancer. And the, and the basic treatment for, the, for that rectal cancer is to give six weeks of radiation therapy and you give an oral chemotherapy drug, capecitabine, with that. So you take three pills in the morning, three pills at night, Monday through Friday for six weeks with the radiation therapy and you're done. So, so I wrote a prescription for 180 pills uh, for the for the Zolotic chemotherapy for the patient and took it to my pharmacy. So my pharmacy gets the, the notification that with his insurance, he's he's we're out of network. So he has to go to CVS Caremark. So I saw him the third week into his treatment and found out from the patient that the CVS Caremark, they only filled, he needed 180 pills. Uh, they only filled 120 because that's what they package. That's what they prepackage. They only distribute 120 at a time. Okay, so so they filled 120 for him, and his first copay was $400, which he would have had one copay of $400 with our practice. But he his first copay was his $400, and then the second time around, they gave him another, you know. Uh, 120 pills, and he had to pay a second copay of $400. But the crazy thing is, these are expensive pills, and so so he only needed to take 180 total pills, but he got it 240. So 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 they just told him, you know, to throw away the other 60 pills, you know, and uh, and not all patients do that. Some people continue to take the pills, but but anyway. Um, they're expensive. They're, so, so you can see if 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 the patient would if the patient would have just come through my through come through my office, and it would have been you know the pills are expensive, so it'd been seventy nine hundred dollars in my office. <coughs> but going through the PBM, it cost the patient and society uh, 
you know, $10,000 rather than $7,900. So, so plus it costs the patient an extra $400. There's delays in treatment. They miss treatments. They get refills. And, 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 but what's really bad is my, my, my patients need dose changes, you know, so they'll come see me and they've already got their next prescription. It's already been filled. They already got their $15,000 worth of monthly pills, but they need maybe a different dose. You know, that's already been prescribed. The PBM's got their dollars. That's right. So, or you need prior authorization. And, and, and I have step edits where I, I want one drug and they say, no, you know, you need to have another drug. And then I have situations, you know, like, like a, a patient that I had that, that died about three months ago and the family called up and said, could you please tell the PBM to stop spending us or, or sending us pills because three months in a row now we've continued to get the chemotherapy pills sent to us, you know, at $15,000 a pop. You know, so so the PBMs are making their money, but they have no idea what's going on. You know, the patient. Yes, they do. Yeah, yeah, they do. They, they probably do. So anyway. <laughs> so, um, so, so just to to get uh, legislatively to this, just a little bit. You know, the Trump administration just uh, put out a prescription drug drug pricing reform blueprint. And this is very comprehensive. And I don't, you can't read this basically, uh, I don't think from the room, but basically in the part D part, uh, which is primarily what the PBMs have the greatest control of right now, you know, uh, one of the things that, that the Trump administration is, is thinking about doing is taking the part B drugs, which are intravenous drugs and moving them to part D. Um, that is not a good idea. And, uh, and, and it, that should be fought because cause basically when you move all, all those Part B drugs into Part D, it gives even more power and more strength to, to the PBMs, you know. So, uh, and, and I can tell you from an independent oncology practice, um, if you do that, then every single oncology practice across the United States will shutter their doors and close their doors because um, that, that's not a good thing. That's the, and that that's part of the... <laughs> I hear the cynicism in the room. Yeah, they want us all to be sucked into big major corporate systems. Yeah. You, you talked about the safe harbor. So there's some elements within, uh, you know, the objectives with the Trump administ administration is to is to go after that and to, and to take care of those rebates. Uh, and then there's also other elements of, of trying to, to get rid of those DIR fees uh, uh, that are killing the, the local pharmacies also. The, the PBM issue is a huge issue and it's impacting all society. And so I just want you to be aware that there's, there's numerous, numerous legislative fronts that go uh, well beyond just the safe harbor uh, issues. And a lot of these are being addressed at the state level because we do have a lot of dysfunction as, at the national level, as you know. So a lot of activity can happen at the states, but there's numerous um, uh, PBM uh, legislations that are occurring in many states in order to try to uh, you know, increase ten transparency and just have uh, better control of the process go going on. Um, the, there's a, a community oncology pharmacy association that, that kind of keeps track of all the laws uh, that are going on uh, with the PBM. So if you really have a, a strong interest, you can go to the COPA uh, website and see all the legislative activity uh, that's going on. And uh, so, so as you know, um, physician dispensing has a lot of federal and state law impact, and there's numerous things that, that can can put pressures on uh, physicians to make it, you know, somewhat difficult to 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 run and manage a retail pharmacy like 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 I do. Um, and uh, as you know, the different states have different rules. And as far as physician dispensing laws, um, there, there's only a handful of states uh, where there there is not in office dispensing, and Texas is one of those. And at least according to this map, there's three. There's only three states uh, that don't have in, in office dispensing. Uh, I see four out there, but anyway, there, most of the states uh, across the United States have that capacity, and and uh, and um, it, it's it's part of the solution uh, of of addressing the PBMs. Uh, but Texas and Texas is one of those states that we have to work on that. Uh, one of the other things that that we're trying to do 
in the oncology world um, is is um, trying to bypass the PBMs by going to direct employer contracts. So you know your your major corporations and companies uh, that are that are there. If you can show uh, that there's value based uh, uh, efforts there and that you can actually uh, give and prescribe and and provide comprehensive for for me comprehensive cancer care. Uh, and, and and do it with higher quality and, and lower cost drugs, and you, by utilizing our pharmacy, bypassing the PBMs and that whole system, uh, we're we're trying to go through that process of doing direct to employer uh, contracting to to try to bypass uh, these these enormous uh, uh, corp corporatized uh, medical entities, and. Uh, uh, the AMA House of Delegates continues to work. Uh, I, I, I spoke on the floor last year at the AMA uh, House of Delegates this last fall to get some P, uh, a PBM uh, resolution uh, passed uh, that basically uh, asked the AMA to continue to push forward with advocacy and study this further and it encouraged you know, transparency and so forth. And we just wrote another resolve that will be taken in just in a few weeks. Uh, to the AMA again, that the, that we're we're going after the DIR fees on the on this round and and trying to get that under control. Uh, we got to work with our, our retail pharmacies also. And the the state of Ohio, I, I would say, is probably ahead of all the other states with with tackling these issues. I'm interested to see if Amazon and Berkshire Hathaway, J.P. Morgan, if that model can disrupt um, the the PBM model at all. Um, and then we just have to continue to do policy development and so forth.